Well, good afternoon. And as uh, you've heard, cardiovascular disease remains a leading cause of death and disability worldwide, claiming over 18 million lives annually, according to the WHO, and costing the global economy more than $1 trillion. It's also one of the largest sectors in med tech, and according to some sources, the cardiovascular device market will surpass an estimated $65 billion in 2023. With this backdrop, good afternoon, and thanks for joining this discussion of the current status and future opportunities in cardiovascular devices. Time permitting, we'll be talking structural heart, <clears throat> ablation, peripheral vascular, hypertension, heart failure, and of course, AI. As you've heard, I'm Rob Keval, Executive Vice President for Strategic Partnerships at Veronex. I'm a cardiovascular physiologist by training and have spent the last 30 years developing and commercializing cardiovascular medical devices. Veronex is a unique, purpose-built provider of global, end-to-end, -end, integrated product development and commercialization services dedicated to the medtech industry. We've got specialized capabilities in cardiovascular products. So if you're working in the cardiovascular space, we're your partner of choice, and we'd welcome an opportunity to prove that to you. So thanks for coming. Now let's meet our panelists. We have Chris Iso from Medtronic, Devin Bream from GE Healthcare, Howard Levin from Deerfield Catalyst, and Murgasha Patel from HSBC. Chris, would you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Chris Iso, I lead business development and strategy for our cardiovascular portfolio. Uh, been with Medtronic going on 13 years now, all in a business development M&A strategy capacity. Prior to Medtronic, I ran a clinical stage biotech uh, contract biologic manufacturing company uh, and had a lot of M&A and strategy work from the pharma and biotech side of the world. Nice to meet you all. Thanks, Chris. Ragasha Patel. I've been in uh, med tech, mostly in interventional cardiology for about 14 years, um, and then I'm left industry to go into banking. Don't ask me why, but most people leave banking to go to industry, and I started uh, seeing some pockets of you know, innovation and uh, thought it would be fun to be around companies like such as the ones here today. And so I've been uh, in banking since about 2018 and you know, advised and executed on $25 billion plus dollars worth of transactions. 80% of that has been mostly on the sell side M&A and then 20% call it IPOs and capital advisory type things. So um, looking forward to this discussion with everybody. Thanks. My name is Howard Levin. I'm the CEO, Chief Medical Officer of Deerfield Catalyst. We're an early stage medical device incubator, part of Deerfield Management. Uh, I'm a heart failure cardiologist by training. Uh, prior to um, doing a JV with Deerfield Management, we were Coridia, a early stage again medical device company. Uh, we sold or started and sold a uh, with our companies returning over $1.6 to their investors. Uh, and uh, as far as I can tell, uh, Chris still owes us money. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Devin Bream. I'm the president and general manager of GE Healthcare Invasive Cardiology. Um, as many of you know, uh, GE spun off uh, the healthcare division earlier in the year. Um, and it's been a really, really exciting uh, last few months, last, uh, last year, with all the, the renewed focus in healthcare. Um, and my group in particular leads the cardiovascular side um, and electrophysiology. So really happy to be part of the panel. Also want to thank Veronex for being great partners. Um, they're just uh, fantastic to work with, and you've helped us on so many things. So thank you very much. Appreciate that, Devin. So Thank you all. We've got a great uh, diversity of perspectives for you today, but we thought it might be useful to help get us started for Murgasha to give us uh, a quick snapshot of the current investment landscape uh, in the cardiovascular space. Um, so one of the things that we're noticing, all the interventional cardiology companies still trade a lot better than the overall med tech sector. Now, you know, there's this new, um, there's a new, um, a category called high growth med tech, which started in the 2018 call it window. Um, and that was really because of a lot of companies going public uh, in that the single product company. So we saw, you know, Shockwave, Inari, 
uh, Silk Road and some of these newer companies that went public in that window and that, that created this new category called high growth med tech. Now this multiple on an LTM revenue basis, as you can see, there's this large peak, right? Um, that was the pandemic, uh, which turned out to be a great time for the equity capital markets. But even though it's resetting now, it's still trading well above large cap med tech, SMIDs, and uh, the S&P, right? And this is all in the cardiovascular sector. Now, if we take a step back and look at sort of Q1 and Q2 earnings, even, you know, I've got all the strategics here and I'd love to hear from them, but, you know, they posted really good growth in some of the sector. And, and this is largely because the procedures are coming back. I, you know, I, I, I don't care what my research analyst says, but, you know, GLP-1s are not going to disrupt any of these businesses. The patient population's way too complex. And, you know, you have to think about this, that these patients really show up um, at such a difficult time in their kind of journey that they sometimes have no other um, options besides some of the devices that are in these portfolios. So, you know, there's strong growth coming out of the cardiovascular sector. Uh, we're seeing a lot of momentum in TAVR, uh, TMTT, and even EP ablation and AFib. Um, you know, unfortunately, mitral replacement hasn't turned out to be the way, you know, we thought it was going to be. We're still not seeing anything, you know, commercially viable there, but it's still early. Um, there's, and, you know, just out of, you know, kind of innovation, R&D takes a lot of time in that sector. So uh, hopefully we'll see something there. And then CRM is sort of the part that continues to um, grow at a, at a modest rate, but it's still, you know, a, a, a pretty great uh, portion of the business. And then LVAT picked up a little bit worldwide that helped. Abbott sales a little bit. There's still a lot of unmet need there. And then, you know, lastly, what I'll touch on is uh, I don't want to um, discount the fact that India and China are basically on 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 part um, on the on the track to become the second largest med tech markets in the world. Uh, it says a decade, but I'm seeing more momentum over there than I've ever seen before. So, um, you know, that's sort of the state of the market here. And then, you know, I'll talk about the M&A precedent transactions. I think everybody knows some of these, but, you know, kudos to Chris for getting a lot done here uh, in the past year. Uh, Cordis and Med Alliance did a DCB deal. Um, that was pretty monumental. And then, obviously, J&J &J and Abiomed, everybody knows about that transaction. I think, you know, Abbott's uh, uh, buyout of CSI was a little... Um, uh, was a little on the lower end in terms of the multiple, but, you know, the company had been around for a while. The procedures weren't really uh, coming back, and the company was struggling, so I think that valuation made sense over there. But, you know, the last thing I'll touch on this page is if you look at the multiples on these, on these right, higher than equity capital markets, higher than, you know, FTM revenue multiples, some of the best we see continually in this in this sector. So I'm really excited for the next five years uh, for, you know, companies at either the mid-stage or early stage and, you know, how they can sort of address strategic gaps in portfolios. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, really, uh, we're, we're really sort of optimistic about this particular sector at the very least right now. And then, you know, I'll touch on the capital markets. We're seeing a window of opportunity come up for IPOs. I mean, if you look at the last sort of uh, calendar, right, the US healthcare IPO calendar, we're starting to see things price, things launch. Um, and, you know, Q Q2 is, uh, has been a little quieter, but we've just sort of, you know, got the data and we'll see how that goes. But, you know, the capital markets are opening up. There might be some opportunities for companies that are doing, you know, quarter over quarter sort of uh, uh, getting their revenue performance and there might be opportunities for them to go public if there's enough uh, conviction in the revenue growth. Um, and then, you know, and lastly, I want to touch on GE's sort of spinoff and how that's performed. I mean, as Devin said, it's gone really well for the company, right? So uh, historical GE still trading at that one, one and a half, a little turn uh, uh, since the spinoff. But, you know, GE now is trading, GE Healthcare now is trading well above that. And I think it's worked out great for both parties because now GE can focus on the industrials and uh, uh, chemicals and sort of the things that they're really good at. And it allows Devin and team to really laser focus on the healthcare business for growth. Um, so, and that, with that, you know, the last thing, I think I talked about this on the last panel, I won't go into it too much, but, you know, there is, there is, deals are getting done in the private placement sector, so I do want to make sure that all of you who are in that phase are not discouraged that there isn't capital out there. 
early stage is a little bit you know, tough, the Series A and B, but we still saw about $200 million of you know, capital get allocated to some of the companies in that portion. So that's not you know, discouraging at all from my perspective. It's where and how you get creative to structure some of your deals and where you find capital is the challenging part, right? But um, if, you're a, if you're a company that's executing, meeting your milestones, and really sort of focused on the technology and the clinical data, in my mind, that's not a, you know, that positions you really well to start discussions with strategics and even start discussions with uh, investors uh, because th it gives them conviction that you, you're going to get you're going to get to where you're promising you're going to be. And then late stage, we're seeing a lot of the venture capital money move towards the late stage, and I think this is just because of the risks associated with this sector. Um, and you know, the, the, I've noticed that a lot of uh, VCs are constantly asking for more data, more data, more data. That used to be a strategic thing, I think, in the past. But even VCs are, I, I want to see this data, I want to see that data, right? So they're getting smarter. Uh, but one thing I will add here is that we're not seeing any new money in this sector, right? It's the same funds that have done the same deals coming to the table. And I think it's time that changes a little bit because um, you know, they, they've got a lot of portfolio overhang as well. They need to probably exit some of their existing companies. Um, so I think you know, that's something I'll uh, end this slide with is that we hope that we'll see some more new investor activity in this sector. Super, Magasha, thanks. That's a super helpful introduction. And one quick follow-up question. Within HSBC's MedTech advisory practice, how do you identify and select companies to follow that you feel have you know, good long-term potential with strategics? Yeah, I mean, I so the $25 billion of deals that I've done, right, I, I, there, there were others' deals, so I won't comment on those, but I've just started originating, and I've just started uh, executing and originating together. And, you know, MedTech is very new for the bank, uh, and so is TMT. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I've started doing personally, uh, along with, you know, our team at HSBC, is we spend... A, a lot of time doing diligence on these companies to the point where we even go into the procedure, look at the procedure, and get to the point where we're really getting ahead of the curve. So when it comes time for the company to either go public or you know do another raise or either exit through an M&A mm -hmm. transaction, we are helping buyers get to the point efficiently, right? So we're not really um, we're not really uh, focused on. Um, you know, helping the company uh, and the strategic get to know each other, right, like, like over time, but we want to make it efficient where we're giving all the data the strategics need, we've identified the gaps for the buyer, and then ultimately we want to get, the, get, get a good transaction to the point where, you know, we're not letting strategics overpay for some of these transactions because that's never a good outcome either, uh, and then we're not letting the seller get too excited about, you know, have it, uh, about getting a deal done, but rather how can you help them understand what you've achieved, what gaps you've fulfilled, and how you're getting, getting, uh, uh, helping them in the next five years to fulfill their portfolio? So, you know, we're not really just advisors for the sellers, but you know, we're really kind of always keep staying very close to the buyers as well to make sure that we're not bringing some, you know, some random thing to them and something that hasn't been vetted properly and we haven't really done our work. Fantastic. Super. Okay, so that's the uh, state of the cardiovascular uh, market. Now let's talk about the state of cardiovascular innovation. So Howard, it's rumored that in 1899, then Commissioner of Patents Charles Duell said that we'd soon no longer need a patent office because, quote, everything that can be invented has been invented. So it turns out that he never actually said this. But um, in, in all uh, seriousness, to your observation, has there been any slowing in the pace of cardiovascular device innovation in, uh, it, you know, in recent times? And not just talking about incremental next generation products, but truly novel disruptive products. Is there anything out there that you're particularly excited about? So I, I think that what we've been seeing recently in the cardiovascular field has been essentially more evolutionary than revolutionary. But there's always, you know, you never know when this revolutionary stuff is going to come. But there are things that make a big difference, right? So, you know, um, uh, you know, in the in the heart failure field, there's always innovation. You know, it, it uh, two steps forward, one step back type thing. 
but there's, there's a lot of innovation. EP field's always hot. Uh, you know, uh, the um, um, structural heart is always hot. You know, the, these things in the cardiovascular field um, are, are going to drive revolutionary things at some point. You know, Tower was revolutionary. Um, you know, certain other things were revolutionary. The question is, <clears throat> at, at getting to Murgash's point, there is a very little early stage uh, money available or lower amount of early stage money available to make those revolutionary things able to be generated in the start. So I, I think that's one of the big uh, limitations. Although I do see, and since we have the uh, strategic people here, I have seen increased investment by certain strategics earlier, like really early to some parts. Uh, in, in some cases, and I was just wondering if you think that's something that is going to continue, or do you think that strategics are still going to look for the more big things that are going to occur? Yeah, so I, I think it's a great question, and it's always a, a balancing act. Um, at, at GE, what we're um, really keen and focused on is developing companies that have actually um, been able to deliver um, a product that um, has clinical outcomes, um, proven efficiencies, and then the real trick of it is um, how to monetize it, and, and how do you make a business case uh, for that for that acquisition or that target? Um, so, so to answer your question, I, I think it's a balancing act. We'd like to get in early, but we also need to make sure that they've they've really proven that the the technology is meaningful and worthwhile. Yeah, and I, I would agree with that. I think the other piece that I would add is. Um, it also depends on the market and the opportunity. Uh, obviously, you saw a lot of the strategics back in 2015, 2016 go into mitral really early. I think I, I was telling somebody, I think the most patients that was treated at the time with one device was 14, when all of those and everybody else was less than that, and all of those went off the board. Um, now, we're all investing in developing those, those uh, technologies today. And as, as was said, right, it, it hasn't come to fruition yet on the mitral re, uh, replacement, but that is a, a big investment. And so when we see opportunities like that that are game-changing and changing the way care is provided and l the potential of basically eliminating MR, that's where strategics will go in early if they think they have the right capabilities to, to bring that to, the, to, to fruition. In other markets where there's, uh, you know, a lot of other activities, then we'll probably, you know, hang back and wait and let let the VCs fund it to a, per, a certain stage where there's actual human data, um, maybe even, you know, even further along in some commercial adoption if they, you know, are able to get get to a, an approval uh, standpoint. Like CathWorks, right? They they actually got approval in U.S in Japan, in Europe, started some commercial, and that's when we transacted. So it just kind of depends on the opportunity in the market. Cool. So sticking with structural heart for the moment, you know, when I began working at uh, what was IMR, IMMR, which is now Verinex Preclinical Services back in 2019, we had this, you know, just a laser focus on surgical and transcatheter valve repair and replacement. And, you know, I was concerned that the structural heart market might be maturing and we'd need to diversify into new therapeutic areas. Fast forward to 2023, it seems like it's still going strong even in TAVR, where it all started. The third and fourth generation devices, new biomaterials, bioresorbables. Chris, do you see any evidence that structural heart is maturing in, in any segments? And Conversely, are there segments that you think are, are poised for disruption with new and emerging technologies? Yeah, and so maybe we start with how we define kind of structural heart, right? So we think about it as the four valves, shunts, and LAA. And so when you think about those, four, those six segments, um, all are gro growing at least double digit, right? And the, you don't see a full section segment like that, that all segments are growing at that level. So in our view, it is a very exciting, continued high growth um, and focus of us to continue to uh, evolve 
and iterate on our technology, but also supplement our portfolio. And that's what we look for externally. And so when I talk about Tavi, right, everybody's, you know, right now talking about Tavi is, you know, maturing. We don't see it. Um, obviously, during COVID, there was uh, procedures were down, um, but that was across the board. It's been a little bit slower to recover, but you're starting to see that recovery and Tavi procedures and, and our growth rates are, you know, still in the double digit. And so when I think about that segment, a double digit growth growing in a in a seven billion dollar market that that is high growth for us indeed for I would say that's for for most of us yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay one other thing that we observed um, as focus started to shift toward the tricuspid valve was attempts to use devices that had been optimized for use on the left side of the heart over on the right side of the heart like mitroclip and you know and, and others are you and Howard please chime in here are you seeing success here with that? Or is this just a totally different R and new R&D challenge? I mean, the right heart is very different from the left heart. The anatomy is different. The geometry is different. And certainly the hemodynamic profiles are, are different. So what, what's been the experience to date? You want me to start? Sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, I, I was just meeting with a company, and they're, uh, you know, been focused on a mitral company. And I said, you actually should contemplate starting on the tricuspid side. To me, I look at the technology and I think it can be interchangeable. Now, that isn't like taking it and just moving it and putting it in there. You're going to have to modify it. You're going to have to adjust the development of that product, but you're not doing a full development program. You're modifying, you're adjusting. Case in point, we're taking Intrepid that was designed for mitral and have treated over 50 patients on the tricuspid side with it. So it actually can happen. Uh, we have to obviously modify our valve slightly uh, to, to ultimately make it a commercially viable product, as well as develop a, a delivery system specifically for the tricuspid side. But it is very transferable when you think about it, even though the, the anatomy is, is much different and the environment in either valve is, is much different. So. You know, I, I think that Chris is exactly right. Everything is transferable from the engineering point of view. I think, <clears throat> I want to point out one thing. You don't have to have a revolutionary project to be a huge market. Mm -hmm. And tricuspid here, I think, is going to be like the, the poster child for that, in a sense, where you have, um, we know in heart failure that, and we've known since the 80s in heart failure, that um, your RVEF and your TR is more related to new mortality than your left-sided parameters. And, but nobody ever fixed the right side of the heart because they, nobody wanted to do a surgical procedure for just, quote unquote, just fixing the, uh, the tricuspid. I personally think there's gonna be a huge uptake on, on the right side with the tricuspid, even strangely more than the mitral. I mean, getting into MR is very important, but if we can work on that tricuspid, and I think that's just the beginning of working on the right side. Pulmonary valve was there already, but there's gonna be that, even though it's not revolutionary, it's an evolutionary thing, it's gonna be a really big deal. So if, if a banker is allowed to add to this, <laughs> but uh, you're absolutely right. Like what we're seeing, right? We're seeing companies that started in the mitral space and then they realized access is so much easier on the right side, and so they've pivoted their strategy. And now that's why you're seeing this growth in tricuspid regurgitation uh, solutions. But you know, I do want to—I do have a question for Howard. I think you know, imaging is still such a challenge in this space, right? What are sort of what are some things you guys are seeing inside the cath lab when it comes to you know imaging for, for within the sector? Because we see companies, you know, come out with really elegant solutions, really great things, but then you know, physicians are struggling because they can't they can image properly and you need this team of like, what, eight or nine people now, right, to right. just do that. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that, Howard. I, I, I think Sorry. that's a really big issue. You're absolutely correct. And we should all blame GE Healthcare <laughs> yeah. for not developing the technology. <laughs> but it, separate from GE, the, the real issue is, is there are technologies that are theoretically a, available. There were things on the left side with cameras for aflip ablation being able to look, and there are some forward-looking ultrasound that now catheters you can see. Um, I, I, there are really two issues, right? One is 
there was never a drive to develop them for this particular indication. Everybody was using TEE, they were used to it, reimbursements in place, it all made it simple. The, but what I think needs to happen is a change in the interventional cardiologist's approach to things. They have to want to, you know, yes, OCT and yes, IVIS are used, but it's not like, you know, you need to get a, I don't want to say next generation, but you need to get interventional cardiologists to take advantage of, or, or there need to be things to be able to show that you sat the valve in the right place, or there's a leak, or there's a this or a that, uh, to make that um, procedure easier within, like, not having those extra five people in the room that you need. Uh, so it makes it more cost effective, it makes a better procedure, but you have to dev then, so it's the chicken and the egg. You have to have the devices to, for people to be able to use, but you have to have the people to be able to use them to be able to use the devices. So, yeah. I don't know. De Devin, since. The yeah, so the imaging side's uh, fascinating. Um, and I was very fortunate um, yesterday to go in and see our very first um, uh, installation in the entire world happened to be at the clinic in Barcelona. Um, so thank you, LSI, for having the conference here. That was, that was great timing. Uh, but uh, it was our first installation for our new 3D stent technology, which is the first on the market um, to allow uh, 3D visualization um, once a stent's placed. And it's a great example of what you're saying, um, because it's not just basic imaging. Um, what we're really focused on now is taking imaging and then laying, layering over additional technologies that make the imaging that much more enhanced with the ultimate goal of allowing better procedural access, but also reducing the number of people that are required to do the imaging. Um, so very good observation by you, and, and, and that's what our focus is. Um, so we used to do one new product introduction a year. Um, we're almost 10 times that from where we were two years ago, and it's all on these image enhancement type opportunities. Devin, do you think that like there was this um spike in activity for like MRI guided EP or a spike of CT, you know, whatever. Do you think that, you know, with all that money spent on cath lab infrastructure based on fluoroscopy and other things, is there ever going to be a move towards more, you know, things that could give you more information but are not, you know, part of the installed base right now? Is it just too expensive? Yeah, and I think we're going to be talking about some of that uh, later in the discussion, but in particular, um, AI. AI is just playing a huge role in what, what we do, our future roadmap, and, and there's some really exciting uh, new uh, startup companies and innovations um, that our friends at Veronex are actually helping us with um, that, that are going to really enhance that imaging and, and really allow physicians to see and do things that they could never have done before. So sticking with the GE um, uh, topic for, for a second, GE Healthcare, I'm just watching the time, this is just flying by. But, you know, when we talk about your new role uh, in focus on invasive cardiology, you know, you looked immediately toward uh, EP ablation and specifically PFA. Uh, I know there's been some recent uh, clinical trial results that have been announced and published from Boston Scientific's ADVENT trial. So can you just catch us up on the... Uh, on what you're excited about there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, PFA is a game changer. Um, uh, it's been well received and adopted here in Europe, and all the major device partners expect, you know, sometime mid to late next year um, for all of their FDA approvals. Um, but what's fascinating about AFib and why PFA is so important, Rob, is, is in the U.S. alone, there's about two and a half uh, million patients and only 15% of those are being treated. Patients are waiting 12, 13, 14 months to get in to have a, 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 an AFib procedure done. And so with, with a technology like um, PFA, pulse field ablation, um, that's gonna really allow more clinicians to do the procedures. It's gonna allow the pr uh, procedures to be done quicker. Um, so taking a procedure that would take six to four hours, maybe down to one and a half, two hours, which then allows more of those patients to come through. So we really see PFA as a great game changer. We're not in the device business, as, as, as we all know. Wish we were. Um, but uh, from an imaging standpoint, we're going to play a key role in, in, in the PFA adoption. Yeah, for sure. great. So I, one, 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 sorry, I just yeah. want to make a comment on PFA, right? So 
There's so much hype around PFA, and rightfully so, but the one area that we haven't touched in ablation is VTAC. Now, you know, many years ago, I did a lot of work in that space, and PFA, we, we started the program in VTAC. And, you know, the biggest challenge, and I'm curious to hear Chris's thoughts on this, is that, it, you know, the it's a very small market, right? The VTAC market isn't something that's, that's like, you know, got this large TAM or growth or anything. But, you know, I'm a firm believer that you don't walk in, to, you don't walk into large TAMs, you create large TAMs, right? And so we don't still have a great technology to address this because, you know, I mean, I, I, I think I've heard docs do like, I'm doing like one VT case a week because I'm so tired of, you know, doing these six, seven hour procedures. So I'm curious to hear kind of, you know, at least Chris's thoughts around that um, and how you, you guys are looking at it. Yeah, I mean, it, it obviously, um, you know, that next horizon is that PFA, right? And that's what they're going to be learning and developing and, and building that skill set. And then it's going to be going on from there. The challenge that, that Devin was talking about, about, you know, capacity in the EP uh, lab is a real thing, right? And so the six hour cases is not something that they're going to go after right now. That needs to come down. That needs to be reduced to a point where it actually can be manageable in the in the EP lab, um, and they can have enough uh, th uh, pull through or follow through of the patients um, in the in the lab, and actually be able to do some of their other cases as well. But you know, you bring up a really important point. Markets aren't markets until you know they're made. You can't market research a market that doesn't exist because you you know everybody will just give you their opinion. You know, VT will become a really big market when there are things that can be used to treat VT in a timely fashion in the workflow. That you know, and, and uh, you know, I wish I could work in the VT area or the ventricular rhythm area in general, just because it's gonna become really big, the question is, who's going to you know, take that first step and start building the market? As, as I heard yesterday from somebody, the a, AFib was not a market until there was enough AFib right. stuff to make it a market. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. OK, a uh, couple more topics to, to try to squeeze in in the last seven minutes. So um, I'd like to just focus on treatment of peripheral vascular disease for, for a minute or two. And, and whether this is a specialty for the endovascularly trained vascular surgeon or it really is the purview of the interventionalists, the interventional radiologist, and interventional cardiologist. But first, Devin, um, in your experience, you know, are there important evolving trends in the cath lab environment? Are we seeing cases that historically were completed in the cath lab being moved to ambulatory surgical centers or office-based labs? Or is that not a big trend? What are, what are your observations? So we're hoping that it is a trend. Um, I think, as Chris pointed out, the capacity issue right now, especially in EP, is just uh, unbelievable. Um, and so we're waiting for, for HRS, the societies, American College of Cardiology, to come down with some decisions that allow more of those procedures to go to outpatient. Um, and then we're well positioned and, and ready with our portfolio to help build out those cath labs um, for ASCs. Um, so, so we absolutely think that's going to be the future, just like many other procedures have migrated to outpatient. Um, and with things like um, a PFA that allow the procedure to be quicker, easier, safer, it, it really makes a lot of sense to migrate some of those procedures. Okay, great. We did, you know, can you, 30 seconds. Do, do we see the potential for, you know, if you're able to take a, an, an ablation procedure from three hours, four hours to one hour, I think, Howard, you brought this up on one of our calls. You know, is there any reimbursement risk associated with that, that RVUs might go down associated with the procedure, or they don't pay for redos anymore? Or? So I think, I think yeah, there, there are two issues. One, you know, the redo issue and the bundling is always going to be a big issue. But the, you have to separate out two issues. One is, are they going to get paid less for the device or more for the device? And are they going to get paid, the physician get paid less for the procedure or more for the procedure? If you shorten a procedure from three hours to uh, one hour, there's a risk that the physician is going to get paid less for that procedure. Therefore, it becomes less attractive to them. And you, know, you have to make it up in volume. But nobody right. really wants to make it up in volume. They want to keep the same thing and do more cases. So I don't know which way the answer is going to go. But it's, it's certainly 
a real concern that hasn't been yet, I think, played out. I don't know. You guys may know more, but I would agree with that. Yeah, it, it still needs some time to to percolate and develop out, and what what's going to be kind of the end end state here. Okay, thanks. Well, this could be a, a long conversation or a short conversation. So with with growing endovascular solutions from EVAR all the way down to the toe, is there, is there competition between vascular surgeons who are endovascularly trained or not uh, on the one hand and interventionalists on, on the other? Um, do we see differing patient outcomes depending on which specialties are doing the treatments? Um, will the interventionalists ever let go of these procedures? Um, is, there, is there enough of a bag of products to really engage vascular surgeons? Um, Chris, what are your what are your observations? Yeah, I mean, so it's an interesting question, right? Because when you think about the the physician specialty subsets, um, the vascular surgeon and the cardiac surgeon are still very critically important in in the overall procedures. The vast amount of interventional cardiologists and, and IRs is a hard challenge to overcome, right? And so as things become easier, as capacity becomes an issue and you need to get things more simplified and easier, they are moving more to the interventional cardiologist side of the equation. But there's still those, those cases that are so uh, complex that you do need that, that surgeon expertise, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that the vascular surgeons are starting to suck up more of the procedures. You know, they started with EVAR. You know, they made that transition. They're going peripheral in the leg. Um, the question that I'm going to be interested to see is how are the strategics going to deal with that? Because you have, as Chris said, on one side, interventional cardiologists where certain procedures are becoming more commodity, quote unquote, uh, and they're looking for new revenue streams, et cetera. And historically, ICs have taken away things from everybody. So they went from the heart to the kidneys, to the brain, mm -hmm. to their carotids, to, to the leg. And so, you know, can you democratize these procedures enough by developing technologies that allow the ICs to take the business away instead of from the IRs now from the vascular surgeons? Or do you have enough of vascular surgery call point that's happy, it's important to keep those people happy. Okay. I gave a little bit more political answer because they're my customers. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. <laughs> okay, all right, we have the last two minutes. We talked about uh, touching on AI, so why don't, we, why don't we do that? You know, Devin, you talked about AI in the cath lab. You know, Chris, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts about AI and implanted devices and, and what opportunities there may be, what risks there may be to uh, to mitigate there? Um, should it be relegated to a clinical decision support tool by aggregating data to try to predict and prevent, you know, events before they happen? What's going on in, in, in implantables right now? Yeah, I mean, so, I, you know, I think a lot of people are talking about AI, right? And, and it's a very interesting space. And I think it's actually bigger than most people give it credit for. Um, if you think about the potential that it could be used in, in cardiovascular, better deployment, you know, the right deployment, pre-case planning, um, clinical trials and addressing, you know, underserved patient populations, robotics, uh, you know, we have a digital surgery play, CathWorks is using an AI. And so these are all, you know, potential opportunities. And so if a, a specific example in the cardiovascular side you know, if you take um, our uh, AccuRhythm link uh, with our AI technology, it is actually using that to reduce the amount of false alerts um, by 50%. And so, and maintaining that sensitivity above 99%. So we're actually getting better results and out outcomes because of that algorithm that is learning. Now, I take another, another area that I think a lot of people know about outside of uh, cardiovascular, um, you know, uh, colonoscopies. Standard of care, obviously, is colonoscopies. We have the ability to actually uh, use our GI Genius technology in our peel cam and identify 50% more polyps that can be identified than traditional colonoscopy. Um, and so we're building a huge database. We have over 1.5 million ECGs in our database that we're building algorithms off. And so it's a significant effort that we're doing within Medtronic. 
specifically in cardiovascular. Nice. Okay. Well, we're 30 seconds over. Howard, would you like the last word here? Uh, I can give Devin the last word on AI because I have, I know less about AI than I do about genetics. So, <laughs> so AI is as exciting as PFA um, for imaging. Uh, I think AI is already proven on the radiology side, um, the ability to um, prioritize which images a radiologist needs to read when they start their day every day, right? So it's proven itself out really well. We're super excited about what it can do and will do in, in uh, the cardiovascular space. The, the challenge is how to monetize it. Um, and again, our friends at, at Veronex have been great partners in, in trying to help us model it so that it doesn't become a, a, <laughs> a, just a giveaway. I know, I keep pitching. It's like three or four <laughs> plus. Right. That's great. It's shameless. <laughs> keep going. Uh, but they are great. Uh, but the, the, the business model of AI is really a challenge, I think, for our whole industry. Um, so that it doesn't just become a, a giveaway or a nice to have. Um, I always equate it to my kids, right? You, when they started driving, of course I wanted to have um, all the safety features in the car and backup cameras. Um, and now those are all just standard products that, that, that are on, on cars. And so is that what AI is going to be for imaging? We hope not. We'd like to figure out a way that it actually adds enough value to the procedure by doing the procedure faster, safer, um, that there's value to the hospital and, and some way to monetize that. Great. Okay, I think we'll end it there. Thank you, everybody, for coming, and please join me in thanking our panelists for an engaging conversation. <laughs>